The Barton Center received an anonymous gift to honor the work of Judge Robin Nash through a special lecture this spring. Robin Nash was a juvenile court judge in DeKalb County Juvenile Court, and he also served as the director of the Barton Child Law and Policy Center in 2006 and 2007. As those of us at the Barton Center thought through the best topics and the speakers to really honor Robin's legacy of service, we naturally, naturally thought of Dr. Roy Sanders and Dr. Betsy Bachman. Their professional service, the dedication of their careers, and also much of their personal life to children and to improving the lives of children, as well as their personal connections to Robin Nash, made them the ideal people to present this at lecture. And we were very pleased when they accepted the, inv the invitation. I'm very grateful for your presence today. The topic is related to um, Robin's legacy. He was so sensitive to the needs of all the participants involved in deprivation and delinquency cases. Everybody I knew who observed his courts, particularly our students, always commented on the amount of respect and the consideration he gave to everybody in the courtroom, the children, the parents, the probation officers, the social workers, the attorneys, um, victims, everybody there, service providers. He just treated everyone with utmost kindness and respect, which was very important. And this is one of the things that everybody who knew Robin loved and admired so much and aspired to do. Unfortunately, most of us who work in, as I say, the system, especially lawyers and judges who were lawyers, and um, we've received very little, little training about what we can and should do to minimize the trauma of the children and families and victims who are moving through our juvenile court systems. We're taught a lot about the legal solutions and the process and the procedure, but there are real individual lives involved, and part of our work should be to minimize any negative impact for coming through the court system. So we thought it would benefit children and be a fitting honor to Robin to help lawyers and judges be more like he was and learn how to respect and work with the families and minimize trauma. And so therefore we've invited our speakers. Um, we'll have our speakers speak today and then as you know we're having a party to celebrate the fact that we are being able to have this lecture in Robin's honor. We're launching the Robin Nash Fellowship Fund, and we have a display outside with all of our prior fellows who have worked with the Barton Clinic. And then we're going to celebrate our 10th birthday. It's the 10th anniversary of the Barton Child Law and Policy Center. So I hope you will join us for food and fun outside. There will be a fun video presentation of our history and a short presentation at a little bit before 6 o'clock, probably about 25 minutes. So now I would like to welcome our speakers. Dr. Roy Sanders is the medical director of the Marcus Autism Center. He also serves as the director of psychiatric services and medical director of the Pediatric Neurodevelopmental Center. He is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Emory University School of Medicine, and he completed his medical training at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Sanders' distinguished career involves serving on the faculty at Vanderbilt University, teaching emergency psychiatric care to interns and residents, working with developmentally disabled populations, and serving as the director of the Schizophrenia Clinic at Vanderbilt. He's also served as a medical director for the Mental Health Cooperative in Nashville, conducted a child psychiatric clinic, and lectured and taught colleagues, medical students, and residents from Columbia, and students at the New England School of Osteopathic Medicine. In 2002, Dr. Sanders joined the DeKalb County Community Service Board in Georgia to help develop a comprehensive system of care for the children of DeKalb County. In this process, he became affiliated with the juvenile court system and the foster care system in DeKalb County. And he was subsequently asked to join the faculty of the Marcus Autism Center, and he's been working to develop comprehensive psychiatric services for children and adults with developmental disabilities. Dr. Sanders will be speaking first, and then Dr. Betsy Bachman will be speaking. She is currently the principal of Inman Middle School in the Atlanta Public School System, and she's been principal there since 2003. Her PhD in educational, is in Educational Studies and Urban Education from Emory University. She received her Master's of Education and her Educational Specialist degree from the University of Georgia, and completed her undergraduate studies at Georgia Southern College. She served as a principal at, El at Garden Hills Elementary School and Morningside Elementary School, and also served as headmaster of First Montessori School of Atlanta. 
She spent 10 years in the Cobb County Public School System, serving a variety of roles, including teacher and coach and administrator, and she served as an adjunct professor at Kennesaw State University. Um, we all know that isn't this competitive school environment is especially thrilling that some of the honors she has received are highest performing Atlanta Public Schools Middle School from 2004 to 2009, 2009 Georgia Title I Distinguished School, a Platinum Award from the Governor's Office of Student Achievement, and Outstanding Principal Honors for two separate years. And she's also served on the Board of Directors for Cool Girls, Inc. She's very active in the Atlanta Public Schools District Leadership Program, serving as a principal mentor and an executive coach, and she serves in a variety of programs serving children. And both of our speakers are adoptive parents, and Dr. Bachman will also speak about her experience as a foster parent. So please help me in giving a wonderful, warm welcome to our guests. Good afternoon. There was a, a bit of a chuckle when uh, I was asked via email to be the speaker here today because one of the things that Robin always told me that annoyed him more than anything else about me was that I talked too much. So, uh, so I get to talk more at this point and I don't get to watch him sneer over in the corner and kind of try and get somebody else to, to start talking or do something else. Uh, my role in Robin's court was uh, to be the provocateur, uh, to uh, be there to raise questions that, uh, that other people weren't raising. And Robin allowed me to play that role. Um, he allowed the decorum of the court to be flexible enough to uh, let me ask a question when it wasn't necessarily time for me to ask a question, when there wasn't supposed to be anybody else speaking except for perhaps him and, and somebody else. He would let me raise questions related to the care of the child and the care of the family and the systems that the children and the family found themselves in at that particular time. And that was a wonderful thing about Robin. And then he let us, he let us have the opportunity then to try and fix things, despite the fact that so often the things that we find in the court system, both in deprivation and delinquent cases, are not things that can easily be fixed or fixed at all. Uh, one of the, my favorite stories about Robin is that he kept me from going to jail because I was in a court, a juvenile court in rural Georgia. And in the court, um, I was giving testimony and I was becoming increasingly frustrated with the judge who wasn't nearly as flexible as Robin was in his court. And uh, at some point I got very frustrated and I said, you know, in a more enlightened court, <laughs> something else may be happening right now. <laughs> and she said the only thing that kept her from putting me into jail when she talked to Robin later was the fact that she thought that I must have been talking about his court, and since his court probably was much more enlightened than hers, that she was going to let it slide that one time, but that I needed to be careful if I ever came back in front of her court again. So I want to talk a little bit today about some of the effects of stress on development of health uh, in children and what we need to do in our roles as uh, leaders in child welfare and with the courts uh, here in Georgia to try and decrease some of those stressors and why it's important to decrease those stressors. Uh, this is from a National Scientific Council on Developing Child Study that's part of the CDC. With all the stress uh, that a child experiences during childhood, there are physiologic changes. And this doesn't matter whether it's good stress or bad stress. In fact, there are three different types of stress that have been described by people who do research on stress in childhood. There's typical stress, and this is, you know, meeting new people, having to go to the doctor, get an injection, having a toy taken away from you, um, minor issues that occur every day in a child's life. And these have low physiologic changes. Every time the stress occurs, it's a physiologic change with a, a shot of cortisol and other stress hormones that make some changes in the brain and make some changes in the body. And children need to learn how to use these stressors in order to grow up effectively and handle the normal stress of day to day. And so the kind of parenting that occurs around these typical stressors or the kind of interventions that occur around these typical stressors with teachers and other people that are involved with kids is real important in terms of moving them forward toward being healthy adults. 
And then there are tolerable stresses. These are the stresses that are a bigger deal, the death of someone close to them, a natural disaster, family disruptions like divorce, uh, frightening accidents occur. And these can benefit the child toward growing toward an appropriate adult and knowing how to deal with stress if you have parents and other adults in the environment who are there to provide adequate support for them and let the child know that the child is protected and cared for and there's a way out of these stressors that these stressors won't last forever, that these stressors, as bad as they are and as difficult as they are, are things that we can work to overcome. And as long as children understand that from all of the adults in their environment, they do okay. If they don't have that in their environment, or if there are more significant stresses sustained over a long period of time that include things like severe abuse and other disruptions and neglect, then you can have toxic stress. And these intense adverse experience can be sustained over a long period of time or a short period of time. Sometimes for a lot of the kids that we work with, they can be sustained over years at a time. But these two can be lessened with support from a caring adult. So it's important to take in that point that even when toxic stresses occur, even when the parents aren't adequate, even when the school system can't do anything, even when the lawyer or the CASA that's been um, appointed can't do anything. There are, if an adult in the environment can approach the child and provide some sort of stability and some sort of guidance, there's hope at that point that the child may be able to deal a little more appropriately with the stress. And of course, some kids coming into these situations with their own genetics and their own temperament may be better able to handle stress than other children and may be more resilient than other children. There's a whole sort of literature, whole group of literature on uh, resiliency in children. But resiliency can be overwhelmed by the stressors and if there's not an adult around that says everything's going to be okay everything's going to be safe then the kids can experience the toxic stress and we'll talk a little bit in a minute about what happens to kids with toxic stress i wanted to tell a couple of stories today and this is the first one this cup is a cup that a kid made for me 30 years ago now and uh, he made it when we were working together on an inpatient unit in a psychiatric hospital he had been sent to the psychiatric hospital by the court for issues associated with delinquency, including substance abuse. Um, when we began working with him, we found out that he had witnessed his stepfather murdering his mother. That he had been in the room when that occurred. He was about four or five years old. That he had actually felt the blood and brain matter and the bone splatter on him from her head exploding when the father, when the stepfather shot him, shot her. He was, he was there for multiple other abuses in the family at different points. Both of his parents, both his natural mother and his natural father, had wound up incarcerated at different points. His natural mother then subsequently died after marrying the stepfather, and the stepfather, of course, was incarcerated. He had several extended family members, all of whom were not available or not capable of doing appropriate parenting for him. And when he was about five or six years old, he went to live in a foster home for two years. And in the foster home, he had a stable environment for the very first time. He was loved and cared for. He was fed. He was made to feel like he could be somebody. And then the foster program changed. The foster parents were no longer foster parents. And he had to move on again and again and again to multiple foster placements, subsequently winding up in the juvenile court system and in our psychiatric hospital after multiple other experiences. In the psychiatric hospital, he came in as a really, really difficult kid, just one of these really bad mean kids that nobody wanted to deal with. But over the course of six months of pretty intense treatment, building very specifically on those two years of stability that he had had, he was able to recreate his life in that period of time. And he went on to recreate his life so much that he changed his name from Michael to Joe. And when he gave me this cup when he was leaving, he actually put Joseph on the bottom of it because he had changed his name and he was a different person. And I still have contact with Joe 
Periodically, he emails me from living in Middlesbrough, uh, Tennessee, and lets me know that everything's going all right. And to this day, he continues to do relatively well. And I think that more than that, saying something about what we were able to do in the hospital, because that's what we do all the time, it really goes back to those, those people who made the decision to put him with that foster care family and that foster care family for that two years. Because if we hadn't had that to build on, then we really would have lost him at that point. So what you do on a day-to-day -day basis as somebody involved with the legal system and somebody involved with the welfare system, regardless of whether it's related to delinquency or deprivation, and the people that deal with the foster care system and the folks that are involved in, the, um, in social work, you really do make a huge difference in kids' lives. I mean, that one kid alone, you know, is enough to keep me going, you know, for the rest of my life. And that's the reason I keep the, keep the cup around, because it's so important to me to remind myself that, you know, there are things that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis to help individual kids. If a child does suffer from toxic stress over a long period of time, we know that their brain is going to be smaller. We know they will be overreactive their whole life long. They'll have a suppression of their immune response. They'll actually be damaged to the hippocampus, the area of learning and memory. So you wind up with a kid who's exposed to toxic stress who has a smaller brain, is not doing well cognitively related to that, who's overreactive in life, and usually that overreactivity takes, a takes um, the role of aggression, a suppression of immune response, so they're gonna have more cancers, more illnesses, more likely to have problems associated with heart disease and, and other cardiac problems and long-term problems, and a damage to the hippocampus so they really can't learn from their mistakes and move forward. So all of that from the toxic stress that occurs in childhood. Another study called the Adverse Childhood Event Study that you can find on the CDC website, it talks about the adverse childhood events that occur uh, for a lot of children in our country. In fact, almost all of us have experienced some adverse events and two thirds experience quite a few events. But these are abuse, sexual, physical, or emotional, neglect, emotional or physical, or household dysfunction, a mother who's treated violently, household substance abuse, household mental illness, incarcerated household members. And what this study did is they went through and they measured the number of adverse events of childhood that a child had experienced. And as they measured those, they then went back and correlated those with the, uh, the adults that were reporting them, the health issues that they had. And if you experienced, or as you experienced increasing numbers of adverse events, you were much more likely to have problems with alcoholism, much more likely to have chronic upper uh, respiratory disease and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, more likely to have depression, more likely to have stillbirths, more likely to use drugs illicitly, more likely to have ischemic heart disease, more likely to have liver disease, more likely to be at risk for violence from other people, more likely to have multiple sexual partners, more likely to have had a sexually transmitted disease, more likely to be a smoker, more likely to attempt suicide. In fact, in one group, if you had more than six of these, you had almost a 30% chance of attempting suicide at some point and more unintended pregnancies. And those were the things that they were looking at. So you can look at what we were talking about a minute ago in terms of toxic stress and the effects that it has on the physiology. And then this study then confirms that those things actually do bear out when you look at these children growing up when they reflect back on the adverse events that occur in their life. So what we need to do as a group of people working together with children is how, you know, just in, in the most simple sort of way, what can we do to reduce the number of adverse events, or what can we do to ameliorate as much as we can the toxic stress in a child's life? And that's a lot of what Robin's court was about. He was constantly looking for ways, while kids were involved in the court system, to look at ways of reducing the stress, not only for that child, but the other people involved in the system, but especially for the child. The kindness and the respect that he talked to kids with was, was something that I'd never seen in a court system before. And I'll tell you another story later that reflects a, a, a way a different judge handled things at a different point. When I was talking to Charlie, you know, about my partner last night about, about this, and he's the attorney, who also laughed a lot about me giving a lecture for Robin because he said I didn't know anything about the law, and Robin would be the first person to tell everybody I didn't know anything about the law, was that, uh, <clears throat> you know, it sounded like I was saying we should coddle delinquents, you know, 
keep, keep them from having stress. We're going to keep all these bad, bad kids from having stress. And so I wanted to address that, no, I wasn't talking about coddling, but I do believe that each child that has any interaction with the court needs some sort of professional help that's not related to legal help. You know, and, and I know that we have court-appointed um, special advocates, but generally the CASAs are, are not professionals, they're volunteers. They have some training, but they're not really trained in all of the areas that we need to be trained in in order to help some of these kids that are involved in horrible stressors. So it's a start, but it's not as far as we need to go. We need somebody who is more trained in the work of case management and care management and social work in terms of hooking kids up with systems where they can go to not only be their voice in court, but also to be their voice in the other systems that they're involved in, their voice in the school system, their voice in the family that's dysfunctional, their voice in the foster family, their voice you know, in the RYDC when they go there, or the YDC they, when they go there, or the DJJ when they have interventions there, or the mental health center systems. They need to have a voice in all of those places, and they need somebody who is trained and able to advocate for them. Now, of course, that comes at a, at a much greater expense in the short run, and there's not been research done to look at whether in the long run that would actually save money or not, but it is a start in terms of looking at ways that we can really begin to speak for the child. We can look at some of the things that have happened in drug courts and see that this kind of management can be somewhat effective you know, in a different sort of setting. And we also know that studies that look at multi-interventions with families, the intensive family interventions, um, family preservation programs, don't work. They don't work. By the time kids get to the system where we are now, you know, in the courts, because of neglect, deprivation, you know, delinquency, et cetera, it's too late a lot of times to go back and look at that particular system. And we're spending a lot of money to try and make interventions in those systems, but over and over and over again, research points to the, uh, to the conclusion that these don't make any difference for the child. They don't make any difference. So we are wasting money in doing that. And in those situations, there is no attention placed on what we need to do specifically for that child without regard to the system. Those interventions so often are trying to placate and please and make the system right. When what needs to happen is the child needs those protections and those interventions that we talked about before in order to de decrease the amount of stress the child is experiencing and decrease the number of adverse childhood events so that that child can th then go on to have less of a level of stress to be the best child that he or she can be as an adult. And that's, that's the whole point. So it, it really is taking things and beginning to turn it on its head, and I think that's what Robin was trying to do. Not that you know, not that I'm going to be bold enough to put words in Robin's mouth, but the, but the, although it's kind of fun to do that since he can't answer. But the, <laughs> is he really wanted us to focus on the child, you know, over and over and over again. Before I ever came to work for the the Cab Community Service Board, when he found out that I had been given a job offer, he called me before I'd ever met with anybody except for Stephanie Pearson at the DeKalb Community Service Board and asked me to come to his court and meet him because he wanted to get me first. He wanted to talk to me first about what really needed to be done in the court system, what really needed to be done for kids. And it was the kids where he had the focus. It was the children that he saw in front of him day after day where his focus was. It wasn't, it wasn't defects. It wasn't the defense attorneys, it wasn't the DA, it wasn't the court system, it wasn't the school systems, it wasn't the parents, it was the children where he wanted the focus to be. And we need to move in a direction that really looks at what we can do best for those children and then grow systems around that rather than trying to repair the systems and then trying to fit the kids back into those systems that are already broken. The study that I have here is, there was a study in um, 1996 called Evaluating Intensive Family Preservation Programs, a Methodological Report, Approach uh, in the American Academies of Pediatric uh, Journal. And it just says, despite current widespread use of family prevention services to prevent out-of-home placements, 
uh, all of the methodological difficulty related to studying this, when we do look at it, show no benefit in reducing the rates of any out-of-home placement or delinquency. And that's just one study that was, that was taken place in North Carolina associated with defects. So you know, we need to move beyond trying to think in that particular way. So that's one thing that I'd like to posit today as a way of looking at the system in a, in a different sort of way, turning it on its head so we're really looking at what the child needs and putting the most important interventions and most of the money and resources we have into looking at specifically what that child needs regardless of what other, any other system needs. And I think that's a way of reducing the stress. We also need to recognize that most of the kids come to us because of a crisis in parenting. There's a true crisis in parenting in, in our society. And I don't know for sure if it's always been there or not. I don't have the research to be able to say that or not. I can't say that in the 1900s when a lot of kids were working in factories and other places that things weren't a whole lot worse then than they are now. But what I can say is that most of the kids that I see on a day-to-day -day basis and most of the kids that I see that come to me that are involved in the court system for whatever reason, one way or the other, whether they're developmentally disabled or not, come to me because there is some difficulty with the parents. There's some difficulty in how the parents engage, how the parents interact. There's some difficulty in the parenting style that's being used. And, that's, and I think that part of that is because we're not being trained to be reasonable parents. We're certainly not being screened generally to be reasonable parents. And most of us are not getting trained, despite the fact that we have most kids captured on a day-to-day -day basis in the school system in, an, in a situation where we could do more training around parenting. And ultimately, isn't parenting the most important thing that any of us are ever going to do in our entire lives? I mean, that's, that's my most important role, is as a parent. And yet we spend the smallest amount of time on training children to parent, and a much larger amount of time in terms of training children how to be vocationally uh, you know, adept, you know, whatever it is that they want to do. There is research on the kind of parents that leads to parent, leads to children who cope best, to children who are individuated, mature, resilient, achievement-oriented, self-regulated, and have highest scores on tests of cognitive competence. You know, isn't that the child that we all want? Isn't that the children that we all want everywhere? And there's been studies by a guy named, or by a woman, excuse me, named uh, Bauman, who looks specifically at parenting styles and their influence on, on children's development. And she posits two factors that have to do with parenting. Demandingness, which is the expectations, the discipline, the supervision, and willingness to confront behavior problems that a parent has, and responsiveness. The parents' fostering of individuality, self-assertion, regulation, and response to the special needs and demands of the particular child. And when you look at those, those two factors, and you can come up with several different kinds of parenting styles associated with that, you come up with children who either come from authoritative, authoritarian, authoritarian permissive, rejecting, authoritarian directive, democratic or good enough parents, and which would you imagine would be the, the kids that had the best success? With authoritative, you have kids who, have, who are, have high demandingness, have parents who are high in their demandingness and high in their responsiveness. With authoritarian, you have kid, parents who are high in their demandedness and lower in their responsiveness. With permissive parents, you have that they're low in their responsiveness and they're high and they're low in their uh, demandingness. With rejecting pe parents, you have them low in both. They don't respond and they, they don't demand. And with non-authoritative directives, you have parents who have a high response, but they're only mild, they have a high demand, but they're only mildly responsive. Democratic is mildly engaging in terms of, uh, in terms of the demandingness and high warmth. And good enough for people that have medium warmth and medium compassion 
and, and medium uh, demandingness. So you have the medium demandingness and the medium responsiveness. And of all of those, the kids that do best are the ones who have the parents who are actually authoritative, despite the fact that there's so much literature out there about how we need to have democratic families and how we need to engage the kids you know, in, in, in the choices that they have to make and we need to be somewhat permissive in what's going on and or we need to, or parents who are so overwhelmed by all of the stresses they have in terms of keeping body and soul financially together, you know, become the non-responsive parents at all. The parents who are highly responsive, who tell their kids what to do and when to do it and how to do it and at the same time let them know that they recognize the special concerns and, and difficulties that they have and they're there to take care of those are the kids that do the best. It's not the kids who have choices. One of the worst things I have, I hear on a day-to-day -day basis is make a good choice. You know, it's not up to the child to make a good choice when they're a child. It's up to the parent or the adult that's involved to make the choice for the child and then the child has the choice of either doing it or not and if they don't, there are subsequent consequences associated with that, and if they do, there are rewards associated with that. That's how children learn. Children aren't cognitively able to make those choices. Sitting in a courtroom asking a child what they want to do is not appropriate. You tell a child what he or she needs to do and let them know that you care about them very much. So we need to train our parents. We need to come up with ways of training parents in order to keep the kids out of the court system. We also need to train our children while we're training the parents to teach skills to reduce risk for abuse, to teach them how to take care of themselves. And we need the parents to, to help empower the children to take care of themselves without having to make those choices themselves. Because there's a way of doing that. There's a way of having a child who's empowered you at the same time you're taking care of that child and you're in, you're in charge of that child. We need to train society that there is a way of looking at parenting and looking at what we do as a society that can make a big difference for children. And we need to do more research on the things that we've been talking about today uh, related to uh, the care of kids. There is a model of research available, um, there, there is a body of research and a model available here in the state of Georgia uh, that has looked at a lot of these issues in terms of helping children stay out of the court system because of problems associated with deprivation uh, and delinquency. And that's actually Dr. John Lutzker's model, um, the uh, safe care model that uh, he has developed over the past 20 or 30 years. And Dr. Lutzker is at the Center for Healthy Development at Georgia State University, and he's a professor uh, at Georgia State University. So he's right here in our own city. And this is one of the few programs of specific engagement with a family that is both practical, that is useful, and has been researched and shown to make a big difference in what happens both with the parents and how the parents parent and the children and how the children perform and how the children engage. So we, we have something there as, you know, we have the, like I said, the preservation family kinds of things that continue to be shown to not have a big intervention impact and, and don't make a big difference for kids. And then we have something like this where you actually start before the kids are ever involved in the court system. But you try and identify the kids at risk at first and you put them into the system of safe care with a very um, specific but not complex you know, curriculum where the kids can actually improve over time and the parents can actually improve over time. And, and it's all written out for us. It's ready to go. It's right there. It doesn't, it doesn't cost a fortune. And I know the Department of Human Services is doing some things uh, with Dr. Lutzker at this point, but it's, I think it's a place where we have a real opportunity as a group of folks working together for child welfare to, to demand more programs like Dr. Lutzker's and to demand more research to look at the programs that we do put into place to make sure they do make a difference before we wind up spending a whole host of money on interventions that don't make a difference and don't help kids have better lives ultimately. In closing, <clears throat> I wanted to remind you each that you can make a difference 
that you can be an agent, agent of decreasing the adverse events of childhood and the stressors that children feel, and that every day you do that, every moment you do that, for that one individual child that's sitting in front of you makes a difference long term in how well they do or how poorly they do. So it, it makes a big difference each interaction you have with a child. Be thinking to yourself, am I reducing or increasing the stress at this point? And if I'm increasing the stress, how am I helping this child to manage the stress that I'm increasing at this particular time? Those are the important issues associated with that. The last thing I wanted to talk about is sometimes being, um, doing the right thing is not necessarily doing the thing that is the most, uh, what's the best way to put it? Boundary, I guess, would be the best way to put it. That sometimes you have to step beyond the boundaries. I had a good supervisor in school one time that told me boundaries uh, in professional relationships are better if they're more like hedges rather than brick walls. So you can walk through them if you have to. And when I was in my early 20s, I worked um, in a group home for kids with conduct disorders. Um, you know, managed to almost get killed a couple of times. Had a girl who poisoned the coffee. You know, all sorts of other things that went on in a, a group home that you can imagine with kids with severe conduct disorders that we were trying to treat over time. And one of the kids became particularly attached to me for whatever reason, uh, and he subsequently ran off. I wasn't good at managing my boundaries at that particular point and had probably allowed him to get too close to me. And when the staff recognized that he was too close to me and pulled me back, the child ran away. Well, he ran away. And he ran to Mississippi from Alabama. He stole a car and he set the car on fire. He wound up in the juvenile court system um, where none of his family showed up. Uh, the judge in the court system asked him you know, what he wanted to do and what he thought he should do uh, and told him what he thought, thought about him. And Lester was kind enough to use very colorful language to tell the judge what he thought about him as well. And when the judge asked him to repeat it, uh, Lester was very compliant and repeated it for the judge. <laughs> and, uh, and the judge, not having any legal training and being an ex-Marine, uh, you know, sentenced uh, Lester to a year at the youth farm in uh, Montgomery, outside, Alabama, outside Montgomery, Alabama where Lester went and Lester stayed for a year. Lester put down that I was a family member of his so that I could, so that I could see him. And you know, thinking back on it, the right thing to have been, would have been to tell people I wasn't a family member, but I decided that Lester didn't have anybody else visiting him, so I was gonna visit him. So every week I would drive down to Mount Meg's, which was the youth farm in Montgomery, and I would visit Lester and convince the people that I was somehow a family member of Lester. And in the course of that time, Lester became increasingly abused and increasingly distant. Um, he, there were incidents of physical and sexual abuse and manipulation and, and uh, just incredible problems with a kid that had already suffered significant issues. And when he got out, he had no place to go. His mom wouldn't take him back. When Lester was a little boy, his dad had raised pit bulls, and when Lester had acted out, he would chain Lester outside with the pit bulls because he was acting like an animal to teach him how to not act like an animal and would feed him dog food and have him live in the doghouse as punishment at that point. And he also had a brother who had killed a man with a pitchfork, and the mother just said that she couldn't take any more and she couldn't raise him, and nobody was there to raise him. And she asked me if I would let him come live with me because I'd been going to see him. So Lester moved in with me, and um, I got to raise a teenager, and it was as bad as you can imagine <laughs> it would be. <laughs> but, you know, we survived it. Lester went on to have a job despite having a cognition that was about the fourth grade level in the mild intellectually disabled range. He learned how to repair uh, video games. There, it was actually uh, the, what do you call them, the little jukebox things at one point and the pinball machines and then he later on went to learn how to uh, work on video games and fix those. And he subsequently married a woman who tells him exactly what to do and how to live and that's what he needs. <laughs>
And she, and she told him and he told her that they weren't going to have any kids because they really weren't in the position to be able to raise kids in a healthy sort of way, and it was one of the best decisions he had ever made. So, and what they do do is they take in rescue pit bulls, which I think is kind of a, an interesting way of coming full circle for, for somebody who had that. And Lester continues to do well. He has, some, he has some pretty significant physiologic issues at this point. In fact, he has rheumatoid arthritis and heart disease despite being you know, in, his, in his late 30s. And I'm sure that's related to the enormous stress that he experienced as a child. But he's not in jail at this point, and he hasn't killed anybody and he hasn't killed himself using drugs. Because his mom did care, and because I was able to say, okay, you know, come live with me. And we were able to have other people in the community that worked together to give him a job and give him a place to be so that he could have a reasonable life. You know, so those are, those are situations where, despite the amount of work that goes into doing those kinds of interventions, and despite the kind of caring that goes into that, you can accomplish that on a day-to-day -day basis and a moment-to-moment -moment period of time with the kids that you're investing in and engaging in, as long as you remember that the kids are the ones that are important, not the parents, not the court, not the lawyers, not the school, not anybody else, but what's best for the child at that particular time. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can take some questions now or we can wait till afterwards. Well, there was somebody who had a question. You want to come to the or y'all want to run around and do the... <laughs> right. And, 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 and I'm pretty certain that many of the family re reunification programs that have been attempted for years to some degree follow that desire of the child to be back as well as other groups that would encourage that for reasons other than specifically the child's welfare. Right. Um, I think in terms of working with kids, I'm a psychologist, so in terms of working with kids uh, that are in that particular situation, I think the learning process for them in terms of how to be safe is often very, very difficult for them right. because their perception of safety grows out of their, their development with this caregiver right. who is their parent. And I just think that when you're working with systems or developing systems that are attempting to help these kids, that unless you attend to that very, very powerful survival-based component of the child's experience, that uh, you'll have a number of failures. Right. Well, and, and the whole point associated with that in thinking about what's right for the kid and doing what's best for the kid is not doing what the kid necessarily wants because kids rarely know exactly what they need, they need in order to be okay. That, that's not a child's role. That's our roles as adults and surrogate parents in situations where the parents aren't able to act as parents. We're the ones who make the decisions about what's okay and what's not okay not the child. And uh, I think that that's one of the problems a lot of times with, you know, situations like guardian ad litems or, or CASA workers is that you get it in your head that you somehow need to follow the wishes of the child. But that's, and I'm not saying, and not everybody does that, and, and that's not what everybody's doing, but, you know, the child's wishes count to a degree, but they're not ultimately, you know, the main decision. You know, if I went home tonight, you know, my 11-year-old would want to eat candy before going to bed and then stay up till about midnight after watching a horror movie so he would have, you know, a, a nightmare and then not get up in the morning to go to school. Those are no, none of those things are going to occur, you know. Yeah, and, and, and so it's, and so you have to, so sometimes you have to tell a child, going back with your family is not the best thing. I know that's what you think, but that's not, that's not the best thing and that's not going to happen. And, and I think sometimes if you go ahead and close it off for kids, 
because most of be truthful about it most of the time most of us know from very early on whether parents are going to be able to pull it back together or not and it's just a period of time of letting it wait and letting it drain and letting it wait and stringing the kids along and stringing the parents along before we make decisions about where they go with increasing stress for the parents and increasing stress for the children and that ultimately doesn't help the child, if that were cut off earlier and the child just knew that wasn't going to be an option, I think they could move on better and make other decisions, you know, with our help. But, you know, that's, that's simply my opinion. I don't have the research to back that up at this point. Um, in working with the older youth, um, I'm, I'm a judge in DeKalb Juvenile Court. And working with the older youth in our independent living program, um, I think some of them draw the conclusion, okay, I'm not going back, but they're stuck. Right. Like, I'm not going back, and we're trying to map out a way for them to move forward, and it's getting them to take those steps to move forward. Do you have any suggestions? Because they just seem to be just stuck. It's just stuck between... I want to be back home, but I know I got to move forward. Right. They, you know, they have to have something to look forward to that, that doesn't take filling out 400 different sheets of paper and dealing with bureaucrats who are not going to show up except, you know, 10 days, 10 working days after the last day you filed the paper on a full moon in the summertime. And, uh, I mean, you have to, they have to have something to look forward to. And so, like with Lester, that was the situation with Lester. Lester really wanted to go home to live with his mom, but he knew that that wasn't going to happen, that that wasn't an option from his mom's standpoint because she wasn't going to let him. What we did was found him a job with somebody he really, really wanted to be involved in, with and wanted to be in, in a job that he wanted to be engaged in and moved him toward that. Helping teenagers develop relationships with appropriate peer groups that move them toward independence and moving them into vocational settings where they really can do well is, is an important task that we have as people working with the kids. And I, I don't think it's inappropriate necessarily for a judge to do some career counseling from the bench. I think a lot of us have to, have to become social workers. A lot of what my job is as a child psychiatrist has very little to do with brain development and has a lot to do with being a social worker and trying to figure out you know, where we go and what we do associated with that. So we have to have better vocational planning and training involved. We have to have better relationship skill building uh, involved. We have, to, we have to have the kids something to look forward to other than just kind of sitting around you know, in the independent living or sitting around in some sort of shelter and not moving forward. What are the most difficult decisions that need to be made is the appropriate matching between the child's level of vulnerability and the adult that can care for them, as you uh, talked about. Are there any good models for matching for out-of-home placements that you can speak of? You know, I, I don't know of any specific kinds of research that's been done around that. I'd be happy to, um, to research that and have our librarian research that and see if anybody's done any studies. But that would be, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Those are the kinds of things that we need to look at in terms of you know studies to match you know kids with appropriate placements because you're right not every foster placement despite how good that foster placement may be is going to be necessarily the best placement for every child you know and that happens you know that happens all the time you don't you don't place the emerging child with a gay sexual identity in a fundamentalist home you know i've have that situation that i'm dealing with right now and that's you know that probably wasn't a good call on the part of the, the workers who made that call, but that's, you know, that's what happened at that particular time. And that happens in a lot of other situations in a lot of other cases. So you, there, there should be some sort of um, work done around how you make those placements. And I, I, we can develop technology. We develop technology around matching and other things. You know, if they can do it with eHarmony, we ought to be able to do it with, you know, <laughs> with foster care placement. anybody else that we can go Thank ahead and take a break it's four we'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back and hear dr bachman and then we'll have more question and answer thank you